We'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the third session of Stewardship Series. Uh, this one will be covering watershed health. Uh, today you'll be hearing from myself, Sarah Hedeman from Little Forks Conservancy. I've been with the organization since 2017 and I'm their preserve and volunteer manager. And Paul, if you wanna introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Paul Steen. I work with the Huron River Watershed Council in Ann Arbor, uh, Washtenaw County, uh, though as part of today's thing, I'm talking about the Michigan Clean Water Corps, which is a statewide program. So I'm going to give some overviews of that. But just a quick little background about Little Forks Conservancy. Uh, we're a nonprofit based out of Midland. We were established in 1996. Uh, we service the Tittabawassee watershed with primary focus on Midland, Gladwin, and Clare counties. Uh, we focus on programs involving land protection, environmental education, and uh, managing natural areas that we own. And we've been part of the stream sampling program uh, since 2015, focusing on the Cedar River. Uh, we got started with one of their startup grants in 2014. We've been operating under a quality assurance project plan that's always approved by my club. I'll turn it over to Paul to give a little bit of background of uh, what my core is. Yeah, thank you. So my core, that's, uh, it's not really an acronym. It's not really an abbreviation. It's, I don't know. It's just something someone made up to shorten Michigan Clean Water Core, my, my core. So this is a statewide program. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a program of EGLE. So the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Uh, it's been around since 2004, though what this program did was pull a whole bunch of individual water quality programs into one. So some of these individual parts have actually been around for, for much, much longer. Uh, it's run through, Eagle is, owns the program and they fund Michigan State and myself and uh, the Michigan Lakes and Streams Association to, to run this. Uh, so that's who's at the top, but then what really makes the program work is volunteers. So we have thousands of active volunteers uh, doing lake monitoring and stream monitoring. And many of our closest and most important partners are watershed groups and conservancies and conservation districts and groups like Little Forks that organize their own volunteers uh, at that more of a local level to make things uh, happen in terms of collecting water quality data. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, Sarah. So what we basically have is uh, what we call a three pillar system uh, under my core. There's three main pieces. The, um, the, there's a lakes program and I'm going to talk about each of these in, in a little bit more detail. But so there's a lakes program, there's uh, a, a cleanup program, which which is uh, for streams or rivers, and is about pulling trash out of rivers, not woody debris, but like garbage. And then there's the stream monitoring program, which is uh, mostly macroinvertebrate and uh, aquatic insect monitoring though there's some habitat components to that as well. Then underneath all of that, supporting that on the bottom of the slide, I have a variety of things that, that make all of that happen. So we provide grants, there's a database uh, so that everything collected under these set of um, similar procedures can then be used around the state from a whole, from a whole variety of people. We have people, we have educators accessing this, we have the state managers accessing this, volunteers, realtors, realtors love our database because 
they're selling houses on lakes and they need to know what the lake quality is. So that's, that's actually a, a, a really interesting one. Um, we have an annual conference. So all of these things uh, support those three pillars. Uh, the program itself is, well, it's a program of the state. It's not a highly funded program, certainly. It's about an annual budget of about $350,000 uh, and about half of that goes to distributing grants to volunteers in these groups. The other half pays for, for the biologists like me. So, all right, let's go to the next one, Sarah. So I was just gonna talk a little bit about each of those three pillars. And each of these are things that you can get involved with. Uh, the lakes program, the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program uh, actually has existed since 1972. So uh, we're, you know, we're getting close to 50 years worth of data. Uh, and some of the lakes in this program have been with us that entire time. So, you, you know, go back, you have, you have 50 years worth of data, which is pretty incredible, uh, uh, long-term data, data source. So the way this program works is that uh, usually residents on lakes that live on lakes, so not, not, not just them, but, but primarily them because they're there and they care about the resource, uh, volunteer with us and we train them on how to do things like take secchi disc measurements, how to take phosphorus measurements, how to uh, test for dissolved oxygen, how to uh, survey their lake for aquatic plants, uh, invasive plants. Um, so we, we uh, so groups or volunteers opt into this. Uh, we train them how to do all those parameters and they're collecting data throughout the summer during the growing season on all of those things. So this just gives a sense of where the, the picture, that's the sense of where those lakes are around the state that are involved. Uh, you know, whenever you look at lakes in Michigan, there's a very distinct pattern. Uh, there's some areas that have a lot of lakes and some areas that have few lakes. And this kind of uh, is almost like a glacial map of where lakes are uh, in Michigan. Um, uh, the ligotrophic, mesotrophic, eutrophic, hypertrophic, those are all nutrient levels of these lakes. So through the volunteer monitoring, we're able to uh, assign each lake to those parameters, uh, which refers to how much nutrients are, are available for stuff like algae growth. Um, and then we're able to track that through time. And uh, because the state of Michigan can't get to very many lakes with the amount of funding they have. This program is really important to bolster uh, the knowledge of Michigan's la Michigan lakes. We have something like 11,000 lakes in the state. So, you know, it's just not possible for the paid state staff to, to visit this many. So we're able to collect a lot of information for them that they wouldn't have otherwise. All right, go ahead to the next one, Sarah. Okay, so the volunteer stream monitoring program, which I mentioned involves um, um, uh, Little Forks. Uh, this is a program where we give grants to the nonprofits, local governments, conservation districts uh, around the state. And then with that money, those groups find their own volunteers. Um, we, train, we train them in the procedures. Uh, so that everyone is doing the same thing. Uh, now the map here is uh, is where all those groups um, are based. This is our current roster of groups that have most recently updated their quality assurance plan and that helps us know that everyone's on the same page and collecting things in the same manner. So while there's only 18 dots here, uh, what each of those dots represents is somewhere between five, to 20 sample sites that each of them are going out on. Uh, you know, and there's certainly areas that we wanna see growth uh, with stream groups. For example, we don't really have anything up in the Thunder Bay area, kind of the upper um, Northeast part of the lower peninsula. There's just isn't any groups operating there. Uh, and there's very little monitoring going on in the upper peninsula. A lot of those groups have started and then funding issues crop up and they haven't been able to continue. Um, so one of my goals for, the, for this program is to constantly expand our reach 
uh, constantly have more and more groups come up so we're able to monitor more and more locations. Um, so I know Sarah is going to be talking particularly about this program, what you guys have learned through your own uh, monitoring in the past five years. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, this is Terry Brockoff from Gladwin. Is the Soil Conservation Department, do they help with some of this or is that totally separate? So the, the county conservation districts uh, do definitely help with uh, many of these. I'd say almost about half of these dots <laughs> are gonna, well, maybe not that many, but they're a good portion of, of these are, are run by by these county conservation districts. Yep, absolutely. It's kind of a mix of them as well as watershed groups and conservancies. Okay. Um, it's a, you know, it's just a great way to get to get people involved. So it's um, uh, so you get actually this wide range of of different people uh, in different levels of experience work, working on these projects. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next one. And then finally, uh, this is a much smaller project and it's a grant only project, but basically every year uh, groups are allowed to apply for somewhere between $500 and $5,000 to help fund a cleanup of rivers and streams, picking up specifically picking up trash. So they're very, the, the grant is very careful that we're not just clearing woody debris uh, jams but it's, it's concentrated on getting junk out of the river. And uh, it is limited to local governments. So something like a township or a city or a county could apply for this money. And then what they would do is recruit volunteers that live in the area to help them do the cleanup. Uh, nonprofits actually aren't eligible because the money is very tightly controlled and this it's all funded through um, through the Secretary of State water quality license plates. So you know you can buy like specific license plates that have for, for different purposes. Um, you get the one with the boat on it and it helps pay for this, this cleanup program. And the money is just specifically earmarked to, to cities and counties. Um, but that doesn't mean if anyone who's watching this uh, can't get involved, uh, you know, a lot of the reasons that local governments would apply for money like this and hold the the program is they have citizens in their area who want to do it you know so if you know in your if you're in your region if you feel like you have streams that like need tires pulled out or trash picked up uh up and down both in the channel and right along uh the banks um this might be something that you know, you talk to your, your city or your county and urge them to apply for that money. And then you would be one of the volunteers on it. So anyway, to find out more about the cleanup program and the, the monitoring, the, the macroinvertebrates, there's a website here that, that you can go to to learn more. Um, Little Forks already has the, uh, the monitoring stream grant. So, uh, but, you know, maybe you guys could consider partnering with a with the city in the future and, and get one of those cleanups as well. Um, okay, last slide, Sarah, from me. And I just wanted to, this is more of an administrative thing, but it, it might be useful for Sarah and Alan specifically, just so you kind of understand how things are structured. For the, for the lakes program, what's happening is that we're working, that's when we have the MyCor umbrella program has its own volunteers. So we're working directly with the lake residents and those are our volunteers. And there isn't any grants that go uh, to those people. Instead, what they get access to is like highly reduced lab fees and uh, they get more of the staff time, more of the direct expertise of our biologists. That's different than the streams. For the streams, what we do is like I work with Sarah and Alan to, to make sure that they're trained and that that everything's going well with their own program, but they're making most of those day-to-day -day calls for the volunteers and where to sample and uh, what their data means. So it's just, it's a program, it's just set up a little differently. And I just like to, to highlight that, like when you volunteer for Little Forks, um, you're working, you're, you're part of this bigger whole as part of my core, but you know, you're directly one of their volunteers helping, helping them as well. 
Um, so actually, so that's that's it for me, kind of just on a big scale, what's going on across the state with my core. Um, I can take questions now or Sarah, whatever you think, if we want to wait to the end, that's fine. Um, we can wait to the end if that works for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. <clears throat> so I wanted to cover some basics behind it all of when we talk about a watershed, what do we mean? Um, and just as a general definition, it's not only the river, but it's also the land around it, around it that drains um, into a body of water. Um, so when we talk about a watershed, we're not only speaking of the river itself. But also it. um, so what does that mean in terms of where we're at? Um, we have the, so there's different levels of watersheds too, um, depending on how small of a scale you wanna look at. Uh, technically we are part of the Saginaw Bay watershed um, and then the Tittabawassee River watershed is part of that. And specifically for stream sampling, we're focused on the Cedar River, which is a part of the Tittabawassee River watershed. As you can see on the map in orange is the Cedar River. So the Cedar River is, as I mentioned, a, a part of the Tittabawassee River. Um, and just a reason as to why we chose to focus on the Cedar River specifically. Um, it pairs with a management plan and uh, allows us to monitor the health of the watershed um, as <clears throat> a group of community le leaders drive improvement projects um, that are guided by this management plan. And that is the um, Cedar River Steering Committee um, they have meetings out of the conservation district and uh, look at all sorts of um, things involved with the watershed, which I'll mention in a second. Another reason it is a part of it is a blue ribbon trout stream. Um, there isn't, so it's good fish habitat already and we wanna make sure it stays that way. So we're monitoring it continually. Um, the Cedar River doesn't have that much development around it, um, so it makes it already like, good habitat and we want to make sure it stays that way. Um, and then another key thing is that it's weightable. Um, a lot of the problem with some of these larger rivers is that we, it's too deep, we can't get it there and um, survey the river um, in a decent amount of time and using the nets that we usually use to get the macroinvertebrates, um, it's too deep to be able to um, them. So some of those watershed efforts that are being done are um, specifically Little Forks and some other governmental organizations work with conservation easements, which is a, a legal agreement with the landowner to protect their land um, forever. Uh, you can see our previous stewardship series uh, covering that specifically. Um, you can find that on our YouTube channel and website. Um, another thing that they look at are road stream crossings. Um, they look at erosion and runoff and if there's um, good fish, fish passage through the road. Um, so here in this photo is an example of a um, redone road stream crossing that allows for um, better fish, fish passage and then has um, some more uh, embankment stabilizing because uh, in Gladwin County there's as some of you probably know there's a lot of dirt roads and a lot of that sand and stuff that they apply to the road can during a storm if there's not proper stabilization can just run straight into the river causing a uh, buildup of sand and spots, which isn't good for fish habitat. Um, another thing, as already mentioned, was erosion control, not only along roads, but also just generally along the river, finding those spots where you see the bank just being sheeted off by um, lack of vegetation or um, use by um, people using accessing the river at that spot. 
we provide a lot of information and knowledge about invasive species and controlling those and removing them and advice on how to identify and um, take care of them uh, so that you can return it to more native species that are good for the habitat, um, for the stream and for wildlife. Another thing we work with is in-stream habitat. Like this photo on the bottom, uh, you can see there's a log vein uh, right along the bank, which just protects it from erosion and creates habitat for fish. Um, we do river cleanups with the conservation district uh, from Chapel Dam to the Gladwin City Park. Uh, COVID has kind of put that on pause, but we're trying to figure out this year a way to um, to make it work. And recently um, from the city park south to Beaverton, they've been, the conservation district has been working towards making that more navigable. There's a lot of ash trees along that stretch and they've been dying off and falling into the river, um, making it very hard to pasture there. So that's another effort that's been done just recently. So back to some of the stream sampling stuff is we collect macroinvertebrates, which might be wondering what in the world is that? Um, and that is aquatic larval stage, stages of insects and sometimes adult aquatic insects. So here's a picture of a few of them. Uh, we get a lot of caddisflies larvae, which is in this picture over to the right. Uh, some of them are case making, some of them are um, kind of more naked. Um, and so they make their homes, they're really interesting out of sometimes sticks leaves, racks, um, whatever they, that species likes or has on hand, um, they often attach themselves to then like logs and rocks and they're very like hard to find but once you look at the sticks and stuff you start finding them everywhere. And they become um, just a flying bug which is the adult is found is in that picture there. Other things we find are uh, dragonflies they actually spend a good amount of their life in the water. Um, so this is a nymph right there. And then here is a, sometimes we get these more like worm-like looking larvae, which is a crane fly larvae. And that becomes this kind of big looking, almost looks like a mosquito, but luckily they don't bite. Um, so those are just some of the, exa the examples and they are indicators of the quality of water. Um, so by collecting these specimens, we can look at, they're divided into three groups, um, sensitive, uh, kind of somewhat sensitive and non-sensitive. And then um, their presence and quantity that we collect is an indicator of the health of the watershed and the river in that general location. And so there's this equation that we use um, once we have over 11, it's considered common, under 11 is considered rare, and then you, depending on the sensitivity, um, so the sensitive species are in that group one, so they have a higher value, and your non-sensitive species have a lower value, and then you add them up, and they make a, there's a chart down here, and depending on what that number is, we rate it, you know, excellent, good, fair, or poor. And um, just to add a clarification, um, just because we find non-sensitive species does not mean it's polluted. Um, they can exist in both. And it's the lack of sensitive species that is more of an indicator that it is a polluted water. Um, so some details about the program specifically, as I mentioned before, we've been doing this since 2015, uh, minus last year we were unable to get out there and safely um, sample our locations. And we do this two times a year in the spring and the fall. Um, we do this because there's different communities available in the water um, and it is timed usually like before any kind of hatching happens um, so that they'll be in their aquatic stage. And it gives us that big picture of 
what the state of the watershed is. Um, and then for the event day, we usually put people in groups of um, four to six people and there's four to five groups depending on how many sites we're going to. And so that's about 30 plus volunteers at each event. And they are put into specific roles. Um, we have our, um, we have a leader and a collector. We have our leaders, they work with the paperwork and they keep track of time and they communicate with our collector in the water to make sure they're documenting what type of habitat they're collecting from and uh, getting that general data and making sure everyone's on task. The collectors in the water with a net and collecting, they're in there for 30 minutes uh, covering a 300 foot section of the stream uh, working their way upstream so that they can collect all the bugs in the net. And then they work with the runner, as you can see in this photo, where they come to the shoreline and empty the net into a bucket for the runner to then take it back to the pickers, which are at a station on the shore. And they're looking through all the debris and the water and finding the bugs and collecting them into a specimen jar. So some of the supplies that we provide you with are um, the D-nets. They're specifically for stream sampling. You get um, the wash tray, which is actually a tray that's supposed to go under like refrigerators or uh, washing machines. Like, but we use it to have that kind of big space to be able to see all the bugs. And then we use a meter stick. That's another thing that's done prior is measuring the depth of the stream where um, you're sampling um, buckets and squeeze bottles. As we saw in the previous slide, the picture, they were using one of those like ketchup bottles to kind of clean off the net. And then there's of course that binder of information and the data sheets and all the information you need to know how to get there, um, the process, uh, reminders of what the different habitat definitions are and the data sheet that you fill out. And then for pickers, we give them tweezers, pipettes, spoons that they find these bugs, which some of them are pretty small as you can see in this photo <clears throat> down here at the bottom. Some of them are pretty big. <laughs> Um, any ones that are like super large that we find, which there are only a handful, um, we sometimes just document them and get put them back in the water. Um, and these specimen jars are contained with uh, an alcohol, which kills the bugs. Uh, they do not go free after this. Uh, we maintain them in our office um, for future um, potential like reevaluation or auditing if needed. And then another thing we also provide is waiters usually. If people have their own, that's awesome, but uh, we know that's uh, not always handy for everyone. So we operate on six locations um, or go sample on six locations. We meet in the city of Gladwin usually. And then um, in non-COVID times, we carpool to um, the site and there are six of them and a variety of spots throughout the watershed. Uh, just recently we had to stop sampling at one in Gladwin uh, because of high water. Um, so we added one of our nature preserves actually. And then other than that, there's a variety of uh, DNR land and residential areas. So we have that um, different levels of development in our sampling sites. And, and this light blue you can see is that blue ribbon trout stream. Uh, so we don't identify the bugs in the field. We, you have kind of a general um, 
if you're picking a lot of the similar, the same looking bug, um, at, after a certain point, you, you know, we tell you try and get something different. Um, if you get, if you're at, you know, past 11, uh, start focusing on something that looks a little different. And usually we have it set up with uh, microscopes, lights, magnifying glasses, um, you kind of work in pairs and separate them into piles. Usually there's someone there that knows uh, these species really well. Um, so there's always someone that you can um, go ask for clarification of like, what is this? Um, and other than that, we have um, parts and pictures that kind of give you, we're not going down to species, we're just going down to order. Um, so you don't have to know all the little details. Um, and it's just a matter of counting. And then at the end of the night, we know what those sample sites were like. And usually in we provide snacks and beverages and it's usually a fun evening. Um, so looking at the data that we have so far, um, this is just the that score each time. Uh, so there's two times each year, except for 2015, because we started in the fall. And you can kind of see the changes that happen. And then this dash line is that anything above it is considered excellent. And your good is about at um, 34. So most of the most of the sampling sites are at least good. Uh, sometimes the reasons that they kind of take that crash is if the event we had planned, suddenly we had a rainstorm prior and usually it's less successful sampling um, if that happens, which we try and try and avoid as much as possible. But when you have 30 volunteers committed to one day, sometimes you just gotta sample. And you'll see these two that are zero or three. Um, that is that city park that I referenced that we could not sample and it wasn't, it was too deep for waders. And then, so you've got site three and four are DNR. And then site one and two are privately land, private lands um, that are pretty well forested and protected. And then Five and six are more of those um, developed residential areas. So some conclusions from what we have so far. Um, we plan to continue monitoring the Cedar River. Um, and we hope to maintain that dedicated volunteer base. As I mentioned, the leaders and collectors are usually trained and familiar with where they're going. Um, so having that main group of people and then bringing in, having those positions where they don't need to know too much about it and learning, uh, it allows us to bring in new volunteers and increase awareness about the watershed and water quality in general. Um, overall, the Cedar River watershed is in a good condition. Uh, areas that suffer are in more developed areas. And we hope to use this data to spread the word about the importance of riparian buffers um, to landowners and municipalities uh, to protect uh, the quality of water. And using this data, we can show and prove that there's better habitat in areas that are more protected. And I'll open it up to some questions and then we'll I'll have a few slides with upcoming events. So feel free to unmute or pop it in the chat. This is uh, Steve Wolkowski. Can you hear me? I have a question. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. So thanks. Um, question I think maybe for both you and Paul, Sarah. is. Have we got any data that correlates um, the freshwater invertebrate sampling that we're doing with 
freshwater vertebrate, especially fish sampling that, that would be done on any of these stretches as well. So I, I think Sarah, as you know, we do some fish sampling on the cedar. And I was just wondering if there's any data that, that correlates some assumptions or validates some assumptions we might have about the health of the, the vertebrate populations in conjunction with the invertebrates that we sample or water quality there. Uh, statewide, um, I, I'm sure, I'm sure there are studies that do this, but I don't know. Um, one of the reasons that macroinvertebrates are really good at water quality is that, uh, they're not very mobile. Um, they're not moving large distances, uh, typically over the course of their lifespan. So, and that's different for fish. So that the two things kind of like are getting at, they get at two different things. I think a, a fish, a fish survey would be more indicative of a, a much larger scale uh, than, than a macroinvertebrate survey would be. So I haven't, I haven't seen studies like that. Um, but if they were, I would imagine the correlation is probably not great. That would just be my guess, and I wish I had a better answer for you. I don't know, Sarah, if you have anything to add to that. Um, not really. We are will be so the same stretch that is, as you know, Steve sampled for uh, fish. We'll start. That's going to be our new site. So we'll start going forward, knowing that kind of um, if there's any, you know, similar correlation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to kind of further comment on that, because that's sort of where I was going, Sarah, it's been, it's a little tricky too, because, you know, you have to know what the fish are eating. So to that point, I'm going to be really curious to see what the cedar on the lane preserve looks like. Just my casual observations are, it doesn't seem like there's that terrific of a freshwater invertebrate population on that stretch of the river um, given the fish numbers and sizes that we're seeing. But, you know, so now I'm like, I'm, I'm curious to see the data. And, you know, that might indicate that the fish are eating other vertebrates, like other fish instead of invertebrates. But that's the kind of thing I was curious about kind of getting to. Um, and I think as we develop the data on the lane preserve and either, you know, validate the fact that it's not really that great of a freshwater invertebrate, Stream, or maybe maybe it's just I'm not looking close enough. So that I think that'll be really interesting to see in the future. I have a completely different question. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you find volunteers, and do the same volunteers return year after year? Uh, we maintain an email list of previous volunteers, and we'll contact them anytime we have a date set, and hope that they can return, and then. We post on obviously social media, and then we usually do a press release each event in the local papers. Uh -huh. And that's how we get a lot of our new volunteers is through that. Do you work with universities in particular or just cast a wide net? Uh, we usually cast a wide net. Uh, sometimes we have identified a few uh, professors or school groups. Uh, that would be interested in it. Um, sometimes, sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. It just depends on the schedule and if they have um, transportation available. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Sarah. Question. This is, whoops, okay. go ahead, Terry. Okay, sorry. Uh, so my 30 acres or so of land is a quarter mile south of the Gladwin city limits, just south of the hospital. Okay. And we have a 10 acre lake, 27 foot deep, spring fed, plus two cedar swamp areas drain into the lake. So it, the area drains approximately a half mile square area and forms a little creek that makes a little contribution to the Cedar River just uh, south of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering 
you know, uh, what th those two, those two creeks that feed the lake dry up at, uh, you know, July, August, September, depending on the year. And uh, the lake has a pretty mucky bottom, you know, and there's not really a good place for trout to spawn within the lake. Uh, and I just wondered about all the, there's two houses on the lake and, you know, the septic systems. And I know the original septic system on one of the lakes was put in some pretty low land near the, near the lake, which isn't, acceptable now and has been changed. So how do you say test to see for pollutants and things in the lake? Is there a way to do that or specific tests or anything like that? Yeah, I don't, of course, Sarah can answer for Little Fork's perspective, but as like, as someone uh, myself who's involved in the lakes monitoring program in Michigan, uh, septic systems in particular, what you'd be what you'd be sampling for would be uh, phosphorus measurements, as well as chlorophyll measurements. So you get a sense of how much algae growth do you have. Um, transparent lake transparency is this like really easy thing that you can do just by dropping this black and white disc down into the water. You know, and any one measurement doesn't mean too much because it's so heavily affected by weather and wind and all that. But, you know, you do it over the course of, of, of a few years and you get a really good sense if your lake is staying the same or, or getting worse or getting better. Like, you're right, all of this data, it's about the long-term effort because any one measurement has, has a lot of uh, temporal effects on it. But yeah, so get, if, you know, it, a, a lake like yours would certainly be qualified to join this 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 uh, monitoring program we have. Um, you could check out our website to read more about the types of things that we monitor for. I'll I'll put that in the chat so you can okay. Okay. you can go to it. The the other question I want to ask is uh, so the lake is about ten acres, like I said, twenty seven foot deep, and there's a pond that's dug on uh, the end opposite the outlet to the, the little creek that goes down to the Cedar River. And there's springs in that pond. So the water flow going out of that pond, it, you know, it's not an enclosed pond. It's, uh, it has some water moving out into the lake and out of the lake. And, uh, there, there's quite a bit of algae in the in the pond, even up to the surface. I'm not sure if I'm even calling it the right thing, <laughs> but there's there is green green scum. Green scum. <laughs> <laughs> is there a good way to do something about that? I mean, there's kind of a not a real big flow, but a partial flow out of the pond. Hmm. It's hard to say without yeah. seeing it, you know? Right, right. Yeah. Um, I'm, my guess is that you, you're stuck with what you have. I mean, flow alteration is so expensive and usually not permitted by the state. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? so, um, that's hard to say. I mean, it sounds, a starting point would be, would once again be phosphorus measurements to see, just get a baseline of, mm -hmm of where it's at. But uh, in terms of changing flow to like increase flushing or something like that, it sounds that sounds pretty weather dependent and I don't know if it's anything that that humans can can do very easily. And you can look at um, the amount of runoff that you have from the surrounding area like if uh, you or your neighbors like mow right down to the water line. Uh, that can contribute to a lot of that nutrients and yep. any lawn fertilizer and stuff being added, which will cause those um, more of that scum coming up. Um, so if you kind of assess that and create that little buffer of um, and encourage your neighbors to as well of uh, maybe not mow, you know, give it a at least five to 10 feet of 
uh, grass or like yeah, yeah wild grass or mm -hmm. unmowed grass yeah mm -hmm. Hi, this is Carla Davidson, and I had a question about this, the sampling that you do on a regular basis of how do you make sure that it's, it's like a rep, the same representative sample? So you already mentioned that a big rainstorm could affect it, but I, I was thinking, you know, how, is it the same number of samples, the same amount of time? How, what are those parameters that you try to control? Uh, so we do the same six locations, uh, and then it's the same stretch. We identify a starting point, um, and usually it's pretty close to the same um, spot, and then you work that same 300-foot stretch by, um, and sampling that variety of habitats. Um, so then and, the collectors have, like, they know how frequently to take a sample along that stretch? Yeah, it's a consistent sampling for 30 minutes. Um, so they're constantly um, taking up leaf litter or kicking up the stones uh, to dislodge those macroinvertebrates and bring them to the side um, pretty consistently. So it sounds like the collector is really the key person that needs to be consistent each time. Uh, they, the collector themselves, I believe every three, I want to say it's three years, they rotate to a different location because then, at least that's what we've been doing, because mm -hmm. yep. then they get too familiar with it and to like the bias side of things. Um, so that gets rotated, but they're always trained prior. Okay, have thank you. Previous experience. Yeah, yeah, like one thing is it's possible for collectors to develop bad habits. So you don't, you don't want to send them to the same place over and over and over and over and over again, because then you lose your comparability between sites, you know? So that's why it's good to mix up collectors to different locations. They should all be doing the same thing. But in case they're not, then you're not, like if someone was just a really bad sampler and they always went to the same site, that river may look terrible in, mm -hmm. on the data. So that, that's a way that you kind of, so by mixing people up from, from place to place that you prevent that from happening. Uh, question in the chat if a river is determined to be polluted then what are the next steps to clean the water do you send the data to someone i mean that's like a huge question <laughs> but um uh yes i mean yes like i mean the best thing to just start working with groups like my organization and like with like with little forks and what you, you sit down and you look critically at at what data you have you look at the land use around the river you look at puts and outs and you kind of, it's it's this large process to, and you, you know you bring in land the landowner holders you have meetings uh, if the same person just owned the entire watershed, because then they have full control over everything. But when, when you're not, that, that hardly ever is the situation. So it just involves this large, um, a large effort by multiple people, multiple organizations to, to figure out what is going wrong and how to fix it. Um, it's this large process of watershed management. So, um, so that's kind of a very general answer, but uh, hopefully I can start addressing that question. Um, so it sounds like that was all the questions you have. If you have any follow-up ones, feel free to send an email to me or Paul. Our next, our next stream sampling event is uh, May 15th. We have a registration open. It's on our website and um, Facebook and 
um, we usually send it out to our email list as well. And then, as I mentioned, we train our leaders and collectors, and we have that one scheduled in the summer. Uh, we just reserved the date on August 18th, and it'll be in Midland. And we'll be announcing like registration and stuff for that uh, soon, um, but just to save the date. And then our last session of stewardship series uh, will be in a, a month um, on May 19th at noon. We'll have our director of programs and partnerships, Andrea Foster, covering some of the key concepts of conservation at home. And any of these previous ones, if they caught your eye and you didn't know about them, uh, you can find them on our, our website and YouTube channel. And I'll be sending this recording out um, in the next few days with some helpful links and our contact information. And with that. A little bit, Sarah, on the freezing or other internet connection. Mm -hmm. oh, maybe it's my internet connection. Um, but I want to thank Paul for coming on and helping talk about my core as a whole and for all of you for joining us during your lunch hour or And I with that I'll let y'all go and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>